This special edition of The Table is a recording of Jean Hendricks, the wife of Professor Howard Hendricks, or simply known affectionately on campus as Prof. Howard Hendricks had a distinguished career at Dow Seminary, hitting the campus and innovating literally from the moment he started teaching, as he was the founder of the Christian Education Department, and then that followed with the establishment of a core course that all first year students took on how Bible study methods and how to study the Bible. Almost every student knows about Acts 1-8, knows about observation, interpretation, application, and correlation. Uh, all those ideas were deeply embedded in what Prof did on campus. He also developed a reputation for the Christian family and writing about the Christian family, taught courses on it, as well as mentoring. In 1986, that was all put together to establish the founding of the Howard G. Hendricks Center for Christian Leadership. That's what it was called at the time. We now just call it the Hendricks Center, and it involves Christian leadership and cultural engagement today. But the foundation that Prof laid and the values that he brought to the center are still with us 37 years down the line. So I invite you to listen to this very interesting interview with Prof's wife about the founding of the center and the values of Prof, which we still quite value today. Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture, brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture, and we have a special edition of The Table today. As you can see, we're not in the studio. We don't have the normal background. We're at the home of Gene Hendricks, and we are going to look at the origins of the Hendricks Center. So, Gene, thank you for having us into your home, and we really appreciate you taking the time. It's a here. privilege to have you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to walk through um, kind of the origins of the of the uh, center, and we're going to consider uh, the life of uh, Professor Howard Hendricks. And who better to ask than his wife? <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to start at the beginning, and that is tell us a little bit about how Prof grew up in Philly. I know there are parts of the story that I'm aware of, but I'm just curious, if I were to ask you that general question, what would you tell me before you met him? Uh, what was his life like? Well, this is ancient history, you understand. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> and I always think, although I lived all of those years when the center was being formed, I really realized it went back to the very beginning. Um, how his uh, parents were separated, he was living with his grandmother, um, but he discovered himself in grammar school. Uh, he loved being the class clown. Mm -hmm. He discovered that it was fun getting other people in trouble as well as himself. So the humor goes way back. Yeah, way back. He, yeah. he's just in grade school. Mm -hmm. um, he did have a teacher beginning in the sixth grade who sort of took, her, took him under her wing, and that was a change. But the big change came because his, he was living with his grandmother, and she took him to this church, small church, around the corner from where they lived. And uh, the pastor led him to Christ, and he became a believer, uh, and this was a whole new world to him. Mm. Uh, and as he got older and had to face, we got, when he got to 18, of course, it was a World War II, mm -hmm. he was faced with the decision of whether he was going to go into the military or not. Mm. But he, if, if he was in, you know, farming or medicine or the clergy, then he, he didn't have to go. He decided to go into uh, the ministry, which caused a huge, huge trouble in his family. Mm. Uh, his father, who was in the military, was very angry with him. Mm. Um, but uh, the Lord had, of course, plans. So he goes to Wheaton College, and there his life was just really changed as he's studying the Bible and realizing the enormity of this whole Christian life thing. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a number of professors that were very in, impactful in his life. Uh, Dr. Tenney was one of them. Anyway, uh, he discovered he was still using his childhood uh, 
uh, his, his childhood uh, advantage of, of making people laugh and take charge of the situation. He became the president of the senior class. Mm. And uh, he just loved studying the Bible. He was a Bible major. Mm -hmm. we, and then, <clears throat> of course, he went to Dallas Seminary. Okay, so let's stop there. Let me just recover one thing. So I take it that the family background, which was chaotic, yeah. um, helped to form what became a major concern in his life, which was um, the Christian family and a stable family environment. That's right. And that would have been pretty important, I think, in his formation and in the mm -hmm. way he was developed a sensitivity for the family. That's right. But he learned that he loved people. Mm -hmm. He... He had several advantages. First of all, he was a sort of a people person. Mm -hmm. he came from that kind of a family. Furthermore, his grandfather had been with the Metropolitan Opera, so he had a wonderful sing tenor voice mm. singing. So he always, in the youth programs, he was always on the platform leading the singing. Mm. Uh, and he, of course, he became famous for his one-liners, making the, audi the teenagers' audience laugh mm -hmm. and... Uh, he would, you know, this is World War II, so he's teaching them a new song. It's V is for victory, and, mm -hmm. and then he would turn it into a round. And, and uh, you need to understand that we were involved in Christian Endeavor, major uh, organization, and the, the city was divided into, into, into branches. Mm -hmm. He was part of Northeast Branch. I was part of Southwest Branch, mm -hmm. so I only saw him on the platform. He gave himself a nickname. Nobody sort of knew who he was. He was just this figure that was always in charge. Mm -hmm. He called himself Nate at that time. Mm. Uh, so everybody loved Nate. Mm. But uh, that was when he was a teenager. Then he so was, this was in Philly? Yes, in Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he went to Wheaton College mm -hmm. and graduated and then uh, decided to go to Dallas Seminary. So how'd you all meet? Well, that's a story. Um, Christian Endeavor was a, this big organization, but once in a while, we all came together in some big church downtown in Philadelphia. So we were we were in a, in a big group, and he announced that we were all invited to this uh, downtown, big downtown ho hotel. Um, and so we all show up at the hotel because this is a big deal, he said. And they're going to have a special speaker for high school kids. So we all show up at the hotel. And sure enough, they introduce this guy from all places. He's from Dallas, Texas. And he is introducing this thing called Young Life mm. for high school kids. Sure. And, of course, when Young Life meets, they always have a lot of fun. Right. And that night they were looking for the shyest little girl in the room. Now, there are hundreds of us in there, mm -hmm. and I am this very, very shy little girl. Mm -hmm. Blonde hair, blush, blush bright red when I'm embarrassed. They have a spotlight, and they're going around the room looking. And, and I'm sitting at the very back table, and I'm trying to be invisible. Mm -hmm. But, of course, it landed on me. Mm. So they dragged me up like, you know, going into a, a, a suspect, going into a squad car um, on the platform. They asked me the question, and uh, I gave them the answer. I was a high school kid. And they, of course, it's no, no, no. It's, it's a rigged question. Mm -hmm. But I stood there and argued with him. As I recall, I was taking Latin at the time, and I'm explaining why my answer was if, you know, rooted in the Latin phrase or something like that. <laughs> something that would impress all high school kids, no doubt. And the place is just coming down, roaring with laughter. Mm -hmm. It's a guy down at the speaker's table who was Howard Hendricks, mm -hmm. who is the MC of the evening, said to his buddy, who is that girl? <laughs> and, of course, nobody knew me, and he said, I don't know, but I'll find out for you. Mm -hmm. So... Five months later, our little West Branch group is over in New Jersey at a very primitive Boy Scout camp having our uh, the thing on uh, by ourselves. And who shows up but this, this leader, for the music leader. And 
I said, what's he doing here? He's, he's from someplace up north. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was Howard Hendricks, and I didn't pay any attention to him. He led all the singing and everything. He's made an announcement, and he said, now, on Sunday night, we're going to have a little, uh, uh, we're going to have a, a thing down by the lake, uh, so be sure and bring your flashlights. We all show up with our flashlights, but he came up to me at the end of the meeting after the benediction, and he said in a very gentlemanly way, excuse me, but I forgot my flashlight. <laughs> it was a plan he made. Yeah, made. sure. And that night he introduced himself. I found out that he was only 18 years old. He had just graduated from high school. He was going to Wheaton College, and he asked me if he could write to me. Hmm. And I thought he was putting me on. Hmm. What, <clears throat> what college guy would want to write to a high school kid back in Philly? Anyway, <clears throat> he did, and uh, we became pen pals, so mm -hmm. to speak. Hmm. Uh, but he was very gentlemanly, and very he was different from any boy that I ever knew. And I told him right off, as we were getting to know each other, that I was not planning to get married. And he said, that's very interesting, but, you know, I had the same idea, and uh, he, he was for cagey. He just mm -hmm. knew exactly how to work me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Um, uh, so, so he's at Wheaton, and then he goes on to Dallas, right? Right. And with this Bible knowledge now that he had, that he was, he was absolutely transfixed by Dr. Chafer. Hmm. And this experience that so many early students had where they sat in the class, Dr. Chafer would speak or teach on the Holy Spirit, for example. And when he finished, he would walk out, turn, turn off the light, walk out the room, and the class is still sitting there transfixed hmm. because of the power of this message. Hmm. And <clears throat> I think it was about that time that I began to think, what is it about I know it's the Bible, but how, how is it that a man can get up and talk to a group of people and leave them you know, with such an impression? I think that was really the beginning. Then, uh, as he was a student there at, at Dallas, he also went on, e on weekends, he went over to Fort Worth and became a youth pastor for a Westminster Presbyterian church there. And uh, he loved doing that and realizing the effect he was having on these teenage kids at that church, the power of, of, of having a leadership position and recognizing that it's not me, it's the Bible, it's the Word of God, it's, it, it, and he's trying to put this all together. How does this work? Mm -hmm. Because he had such an... In fact... <clears throat> Uh, when he graduated, then he took, a, in Fort Worth, he became a pastor of a church, many of them that were from that youth group. Um, and the whole development of this leadership position, uh, I could just see it working in his experience. So his, uh, he, he, he didn't talk about it a lot to me. I'm just getting it from watching him. So so there are kind of two things going on. There's this there's this deep DNA about the power of the Word of God. Yes. Which he, and is picking up. Yeah. I imagine he picked it up initially at Wheaton and then at all Dallas did Absolutely. reinforce that. Absolutely, yeah. And then there's this leadership development and particularly um, leadership aimed at, at very young people and developing them from a very early point on with a total commitment to a kind of discipleship that leads into the into real ma Christian maturity. That's right. Both of those pieces, of course, are very, very important to everything that Dallas does, na even now. Oh, sure. And, uh, and, uh, and really is a part of what we regard, I think, as our own DNA in terms of, uh, of the way we train uh, people to lead people into the Word of God and lead them into maturity in, in the faith. Exactly. Yeah. So as he developed on in, as the, then when he, he, as I said, he, was, he served in the pastorate, but this is Fort Worth, and Dr. Walver had him coming back on weekdays to teach because he, he was a theology major, and he loved to teach. Hmm. Uh, 
And again, he was growing in this whole concept of realizing the power of the Word of God, but also the way it affected people. That some people used it, or, or God gifted them in a way that they could teach other people. I, I, I don't know, I'm assuming, that that concept was growing in his mind like, I've got to find out. There was an obsession that he had. Mm -hmm. how, how does this work? Mm -hmm. How do you make other people want to know the word? He was excited about the word, but how do you make other people get excited about Interesting. it? Interesting. So he, well, of course, he, one of the lines that he's known for for all his students is, is that it's, it's a sin to bore people with the Bible. I mean, so, um, so, so let's turn to the to the time when we comes in and and informs a new department, Christian education, which doesn't fit the normal mo mold of what seminary education looked like at the time. That's Completely right. new innovation. Um, I, I, I don't know how to ask this question delicately. How was that received when it was initially uh, <laughs> when it was initially proposed? Well, I have to be very honest with you. It was not well received. Mm -hmm. You see, as he served in the pastorate, he understood I am well qualified to teach these adult people, but I do not know what to do with these little kids in the junior department. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he took one summer, Wheaton College in their graduate school. Was, they were, it was in its infancy at that time, mm. but the Christian education concept mm -hmm. was growing. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So he, he took that course from them. And then he, uh, there was a professor at uh, NYU, mm. and <clears throat> he signed up with him, but he only got a little way with him when Dr. Walford called and said Dr. Chafer had died. Mm. And uh, Dr. Nash, who was the registrar, had had a heart attack mm. at the same time. And he said, Howie, you've got to come back here and teach theology for mm. me. Mm. So we packed up the little kids and all went back to Dallas. And that's when he started to teach. So he was teaching theology to begin with. You know, that's something I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that was his major when he was in seminary. I see. And then... Uh, and then uh, and then there's this transition, right, because of this other concern. Well, he said to Dr. Walbert, I'll come back and teach theology if you let me teach one course in Christian ed. <laughs> the KG, <laughs> the KG prof is at work, huh? <laughs> well, he came back <laughs> uh -huh. and uh, he was allowed to teach, but I have to admit that some of the older members on the faculty were not happy about it. They felt he was introducing some foreign idea that was not, consonant with the seminary. However, it grew, and as you know, the department was was founded, and he loved it. But again, this whole idea of leadership, how we de how do we develop these little children and mm -hmm. old young people into becoming people who will again teach others? So the uh, obsession was growing in his mind. You know, this is interesting. I was talking to my wife, Sally, last night. We were talking about Prof, and uh, she said, you know, the one thing that I really appreciate about Prof is I never felt like an appendage to you, to you speaking about me, uh, a, a, a seminary Prof's wife. I, he always related directly to me, and he seemed to have an ability to see potential in people that they didn't see in themselves. I'm a good example of that. I mean, as I told you, I was a very shy little girl, uh, and uh, I didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> <laughs> because, as I said, he made me a teacher of this little class, mm -hmm. but then as we were intermingling with other people, he was always putting me out where I had to do something mm -hmm. that I hadn't done before. Mm -hmm. uh, and he didn't, he wasn't a t teacher in that he taught me at home, but whenever I asked him a question, mm -hmm. he always, he would say, well, go study Romans 8 or whatever, mm -hmm. and then we'll talk about it. Mm. That was the way he taught me. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a very informal thing, as well as, you know, my sitting in and listening to him. Mm -hmm. Of course, I wasn't in his classes at mm -hmm. the seminary, but I had all these other opportunities to hear him. So this innovation that he brought, which wasn't initially well received, he and I've talked long and hard about this um, because of my own experience. And so, um, uh, but eventually 
he did something, and we, he and I have talked about this a lot, that sometimes when you're in a situation where people are uncomfortable with what it is you're trying to do, the best thing to do is to just show its effectiveness. Yes. And to just, and to do what you think is right, and if the Lord is honoring it, it'll get lifted up, and then it'll be regarded. So by the, you know, you think about here he founded this, this department that, that was innovative and was challenged initially, but by the time I came as a student in the 1970s, the Christian Education Department at Dallas Seminary was well recognized and was leading other schools in the area, et cetera. And the whole mentorship, discipleship, leadership thing was, was very, very right prominent in his thinking. Uh, all of that was going on. So he, he just let what he was doing speak for itself. He did. But remember, he he realized early on this is not a solo performance. Yes. And what he started to do was to look for other leaders. Like, for example, one of the earliest ones was uh, uh, Tom Landry. Because mm -hmm. uh, he, he used to go over to the, the, the uh, practice. Every Wednesday, he went to the practice field. And he got to know Tom, and they became friends. But he was, he was observing how Tom interacted with his players. Mm. Uh, and then he did the same thing with, well, uh, any leader that he could find. Mm -hmm. um, he was very much involved with the military. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he uh, found out from some friends that the military was, teach was, te was teaching leadership mm. up in Virginia. So we went up there, and he got invited to sit in on their uh, leadership training, and then we eventually went to the Pentagon where he was. Te he began teaching some of the guys at the Pentagon. Hmm. So the whole his his field of, of reference was was growing in number. So of he years. was really a student of leadership long before the leadership center came along. He was he, he, he just he was fascinated by it. What hmm. it, I think this question of what makes somebody so important and attractive that all these other people want to come and, and learn from him. Hmm. And of course, he, he used his, uh, as I said, when he was a teenager, he used his singing voice, and then he, he used his ability, you know, he had an ability for one-liners, mm -hmm. make the audience laugh mm -hmm. uh, and feel uh, comfortable with mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. So we come to the 1980s, and, uh, you know, he's, prominent. He's, uh, you've already alluded to his relationship he had with the Dallas Cowboys and Tom Landry. Um, he's well known internationally. I think I came across him the first time going to some event for Campus Crusade that I attended. Well, that, yeah, that was another, he, with Bill Bright, he mm -hmm. was uh, very much involved with the, which is now crew, but, mm -hmm. uh, and of course a lot of students came to the seminary just because he taught every summer for Campus Fifth Aid. Yeah, of course I was a young lifer, so I was crossing yeah. uh, tribal <laughs> lines by doing yeah. this, but still it was, um, yeah, you know, he, he was just captivating. Um, and, uh, and what was beautiful about it was he was captivating on the one hand, but the word was coming across on the other. I mean, it would that combination was just so uniquely stirred by the way he taught. Well, he was very much involved with understanding that is not in the person. Uh, so he re did a lot of reading. One of his the first books that he, he talked about a lot was the Training of the Twelve by A. B. Bruce. Sure, yes. It was one of his basic studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then Barclay's uh, commentary on the Book of Mark, mm -hmm. um, because uh, the training of the Twelve sort of moved him into the Book of Mark, right. where he, he realized that it was the very first chapter of, of Mark where Jesus c c got the Twelve together mm -hmm. and realized you've got to have a group that work with you. You, you can't do this by yourself. Mm -hmm. You may be that figurehead, but it's not all about you. Interesting. So let's talk about the origins of the center a little bit. We're in the 1980s, and um, leadership is a challenge. And the, uh, there's a citation, I think, that comes in. Uh, I, I think it, as I walk into my office every, every day in the Hendricks Building, there's a display with a picture of Prof, and there's a quote there about, uh, about the importance of character in, in, in Christian work. And... Um, 
that's what I see him doing with the center is focusing on, all right, now, what does it take to be a leader? And then what does a leader do with the stewardship and responsibility that he has as a leader for the people around him in forming an organization that's going to go somewhere? Right. It's, you have to know what you're doing <clears throat> and, and pass it along to other people in the proper way. <clears throat> As I said, you didn't do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, the, the center was an idea, but you couldn't get that idea into uh, formation without help. Mm -hmm. So you had to have uh, financial help. Mm -hmm. So you had Bill C., mm -hmm. who Bill and Marge C., they, Bill was once ser served as the uh, mayor of Highland Park, mm. and uh, he, he, he funded the thing. Mm. Um, and then you had uh, other people come along, like, uh, <clears throat> well, of course, uh, right out of the military was his uh, right-hand man, um, you thinking of Chuck? Pardon? You're thinking of Chuck Swindoll? Or are you thinking no, of not, not Chuck, but let me see. Uh, the, the guy that uh, was uh, Andy Seidel. Andy Seidel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he helped him put together. There was uh, uh, a number of young men mm -hmm. that he called around him that were very gifted people. Mm -hmm. And then there were, was the, uh, the woman, Pam Cole. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, when she came on board, she was in... See, Allie was not a detailed person. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think anybody, yeah. everybody knew that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he had ideas. Uh-huh. And Pam took care of all those details. Yes. Uh, uh, Brad Smith was another one. That sure, and Andy Wildman, yeah. Uh, Andy Wildman. Yeah. Uh, so he had this group of people mm -hmm. that he depended upon. Mm -hmm. They were all gifted people. Mm -hmm. uh and he loved them, but he loved his students. Mm -hmm. You know, in the early days, the seminary used to give the professors a page with the pictures of each new student that was going to be coming into the class. They still do this today. Yeah. And he would sit in, and memorize the night before the mm -hmm. class. When he got to the school, he would greet each person by, and they're brand new, they've never been mm -hmm. there, and he knows their name, mm -hmm. where they're from, and I mean, it just blew them away, of mm. course. He just loved doing things like that. Mm. Uh, of course, the school was small, so right. you, you only had 15 or 20 students, but it was a, it was one of his favorite things to do. So so he forms the, the center and, and builds around the leadership idea and builds around uh, this this training of both character and organization. Um, the seminary has also ended up initially placing spiritual formation, which would speak about another innovation, uh, you know, coming to a seminary, it's an educational institution, and we're gonna invest not just in the classroom and what they learn, but we're actually gonna pay attention to where they are spiritually. Spiritual formation came in during this time, and, and the center was initially responsible for the spiritual formation of the student. That's right, yes and worked on that. That's actually how my relationship with the center began because I helped when they were planning the curriculum to develop the spiritual formation. They turned to me uh, as one of their consultants, if you will, yeah. to help build that program and build its base. So, um, uh, and, and that's actually where I got to, new pro got to know Prof. Um, uh, we, uh, we were working on the spiritual formation side of things and in, very informally connected to the center. Um, and then eventually uh, when Bill Lawrence came in, uh, I, he asked me to, to come help more formally. And so I had this kind of, uh, I guess, sidebar relationship to the center for years that was, uh, and we would go out for lunch once a semester and just talk about leadership and and uh, well, see, the he, same evangelical. He was, I think, gifted mm -hmm. in pointing out who were specific co-leaders. Mm -hmm. You were one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he knew, he just sort of knew intuitively mm -hmm. This guy is going to make it. He's going to be able to take charge, mm -hmm. uh, and so it was a it was a gift that God gave him. And of course, as you know, uh, there were a number of groups that sp uh, spun off of mm -hmm. his ministry, like uh, Family Life Ministries mm -hmm. and so forth. 
And all, all formed by people who he had discipled, basically. That's right, his yeah. disciples. He loved every one of his students. We had this house, and we had a big house before this one. And uh, we Thanksgiving or any other time, we had filled with students. Hmm. Also, we went, we tried, he tried to convince the seminary to make it a, 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 a formal thing, but we went out and, and visited alumni. Hmm. But he wanted to know what happens to you when you get out there in the field. Sure. And we, because it's not always a pretty picture. Yeah. And, uh, but the seminary felt like they couldn't do that at the time. Yeah. But he was very much interested in the alumni. So here, here's an interesting fact, because um, uh, um, this relates to how I came into the center. Um, so what happened, of course, in the 80s, we were in one situation. And as, as we move into the 80s and then change, the millennium comes and we're into 2000s, the world around us is shifting immensely. Exactly. And, um, and, and so Mark Bailey and I started these podcasts. Uh, we started these podcasts, which were not connected to the center originally, uh, that we would do. And then in 2010, when we went to Cape Town for the Lausanne Global Event, um, we met with alumni, Mark and I, and, uh, and Mark asked a question. He said to the alumni, what can we do to continue to serve you? And he said, well, keep these podcasts coming. They really minister to us. And it was like, it was 50 people in the room, and it was like this came up, and everyone signed on to the idea and, and reinforced it. So I'm walking out of that meeting with Mark Bailey, and I said, you know, we do these podcasts. They're ad hoc. Uh, we do them when our schedules match, when we think something is important enough to talk about. But there's no rhyme or reason to what we're doing. We're just doing it as it pops up as a need. They're asking for more intentionality in terms of how we do this. And so that started the conversation, and, and our culture had shifted to the point where it became clear you couldn't lead well even if you had great character and you knew how to build an organization without understanding what's going on around you. And uh, so that led into the request of my coming into the center and, and one, launching a podcast with, with some intentionality behind it. We ended up calling it, of course, The Table. And, uh, and helping, helping the church cope with what has been a massive cultural shift from yes. the time when our ministry started all the way to, even to the present. That's true, yes. And so we came in and we, again, I, we used to meet once a semester, just go out to lunch and talk about what was going on and, and, the, and the challenges that that produced for the church uh, in the way of thinking through what's going on. Andy Seidel was still connected to the center when I first mm -hmm. came. And, uh, and so we put these two wings now, leadership, which of course, Bill, your, your son now, helps us with and it's just been a wonderful addition for us. It's encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> and and of course I've had responsibility on the cultural engagement side. But that's how the center emerged. We were trying to we were trying to fill out the way the leader functions in the world and to make them aware and, of how to do it. It moves with the way the culture is moving. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and so um so that was the challenge in the life of the center. So, so let me ask you this, and this is kind of be where we're laying the plane. Um, what do you? What are some of the things about leadership that you absorbed from Prof that you think, when you think of the leadership center, um, these are things you can't forget? Well, I would have to say relationships first of all. Uh, this was not my background, but I learned so much, so much from him because he just glommed on to people. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter who he, who they were. Now he, of course, some there were always some who who sort of backed off. But then there were the guys, you know, like Chuck Swindoll, mm -hmm. who you know came up and and he said Chuck would sit on the very front row in the middle this the minute the class was over Chuck would be out the door with him asking questions that kind of thing uh but he, he had a so he, he developed this sense of people that who who were uh, teachable i guess mm -hmm. is the best word mm. um but he, that, the main thing that hit me, and I think hit his family as well, he was always involved 
with some student. Whenever he traveled, he took students with him, uh, especially in the early days when the children were young, always took students with him And when he traveled. Um, he was always trying to uh, get to know people, mm. uh, not to impress them. Right. His relationships, he just knew how to uh, move into a person's life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I experienced it myself, but mm -hmm. I saw it with all these other people. And it wasn't a fake thing. It wasn't like he's trying to get them to do something for him. Mm -hmm. He just wanted to know people and to love people. Mm -hmm. you know, God gave him that ability. You know, yeah. it's interesting. Um, the thing, One of the things I remember about Prof, I've, I've talked to uh, Bill about this a lot. Um, that um, I remember being in an event. It was a it was a student orientation event, and we were sitting next to one another. Uh, this would have been somewhere in the two thousands. And um, and Prof actually were times when he was actually quite shy himself, even though he was so extroverted. It was an interesting contrast. That's, that's so it, exactly right. So he's very low key. You know, we're just having a common conversation, and so, you know, the tone is about like this. It's pretty quiet. <laughs> and then it comes time for him to speak, and all of a sudden, all this energy just pours out of him. You're and exactly I'm right. sitting next to him, and I'm going, where would that come from? I mean, because the, the decibel level just left the minute, up. The minute he got on the platform in front of a group of people, you're right. He sort of it just exploded out of him. Yeah. And he loved it. See, he learned that when he was in grade school, you know, when he was making a fool out of himself. Huh. But I mean, he learned that the, I hate to call it the thrill, but it was something in him that it, it was a satisfaction. Yeah. And when he saw a group of people in front of him, he just had to relate and say whatever it was. Well, he's gonna... connecting and capturing them. I yeah. mean, it was, it, 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 and I remember being so impressed with this, the difference and the ability to modulate up and to grab a big crowd, because what it meant is he was grabbing a big cloud. It was like he was putting his hands around everybody. That's right. And um, and, and pulling them in and drawing them into whatever it was he was I talking think about. Very uh, personally, he was very shy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he never, th because of his background, his family, and so forth, he never thought of himself as being important. Mm -hmm. He just was so amazed at what God had done in his mm -hmm. life. So, uh, and he, <laughs> if he knew it, we were sitting here talking about yeah, it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> said, you don't need to do that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but, but the, the fact is, he's an example of the thing he often would talk about, which is God can take anyone from anywhere, and they seemingly seem to have very little to offer, and God can shape them and mold them and make them into, uh, make them into a leader. That's right. Uh, and and Prof was consumed with how do you do that? How do you do that well? Let's study how we do that. Let's think about how we do that. Let's think about the character that the person has, the organization that they're attached to, that they have to give energy to, and let's also think about the way they have to understand what's going on around them in order to make sense out of and what's going on. it's all based on the scriptures. And, and rooted deeply, deeply, deeply in a conviction that Jesus Christ makes sense out of life, that God is at work in His grace, that people need the Spirit of God in order to make sense out of their lives. Yes, that, that whole truth of the power of the Holy Spirit, which I know he got from Dr. Chafer, mm -hmm. uh, it never left. Mm. He understood if the Holy Spirit is not working in your life, you know, you're wasting your time. Yeah, well, that's a good, <laughs> it's a good way to, to kind of uh, wrap up what we've been talking about. Because I I, well, the one thing that is constant in his life, and the reason he would be very uncomfortable that we're doing this, so we apologize, uh, <laughs> is, uh, it is, here is a man who drew on the resources that God provided, lifted the Lord up in his life and teaching so that other people would be drawn to the light. Right. And I think that he never forgot that we will all stand before the Lord to give account for what he has given to us. Mm -hmm. And he was very moved by the fact that God had given him some skills. He didn't. He didn't make them up. God gave them to him, and he used them for God's glory as best he could. 
Well, he was a very gifted man, and you've given us a gift today by sharing uh, what the life of prophet has been like. Well, I am. I, I thank the Lord every day. I see his pictures I've got around here, and uh, I just am, am so amazed that God led me into his life. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I'm so honored and privileged to even still have the name Hendrix. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Well, thank you, Gene, very, very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.